the last question, just, just uh, there are uh, some uh, diagrams here, like this, and here there are some uh, steel compositions, yes, you have two compositions. So what you have to do is simply this goes here and this corresponds to this, okay? Nothing more. Just use arrows, no English needed.
So, everybody done? Who's not done? Can I see it? hands? Who is not done? Who needs more time? Nobody? Nobody needs more time? Okay, so then can you bring it in? Here? Collect the paper. Make sure your name is on it. Make sure your name is on it. All right, good. So um, let's backtrack a little bit. So we were talking about concept of hardenability steels. And uh, it's very important in, uh, for engineering steels. And um, because um, hardenability depends very much on composition. And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, we, we, I'm, tr I'm going to explain to you why, why composition comes into the, the picture and, and how the thing is approached technologically. So uh, take a piece of steel in um, a hardenability test, you austenitize it, and then um, you can either quench it at one end, yes, or quench a bar of a certain diameter. And you can measure the hardness from the quenched end, and you can measure the hardness when you make the, the cross-section of this sample from the um, uh, edge, quenched edge um, surface to the middle and back, and you get a hardness profile. And obviously, a material that's very hardenable yes, will have a very flat hardness profile in both cases. So um, what causes this drop here in, uh, in the hardness is basically the smaller cooling rates. So a, a material that can easily harden, that is become martensite, um, at low cooling rates is said to be very hardenable or have a high hardenability, yes? So, and I already illustrated this, that uh, so carbon is important uh, because it determines the, the hardness of your material. It's one thing. Um, uh, but the other alloying elements are, are important because they change the kinetics of the martensitic transformation. Hmm? So that's how they come into the picture of the hardenability. Right, so let's, let's have a look. I have, we, we already discussed this, um, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. If you have a material like uh, with 0.4% of carbon, yes, you have a version without much alloying elements, and a version with uh, some manganese, uh, half a percent of chrome, and 0.2% of molybdenum. This is the hardness profile you get. Yeah? And if you have a uh, even uh, more alloying elements in your um, steel, like 1.8% manganese, chrome, and moly, you have a very flat hardness profile as a function of the distance from the quenched end. Yes. All right. So, um, so one of the things we're interested in, uh, in uh, technological reasons, as we'll say, um, is the the 50% uh, martensite microstructure. Yes and the 100% um, the uh, uh, microstructures. And for hardenability, very often, uh, the, um, the, the critical diameters, et cetera, that we'll talk about are for 50% of uh, martensite in the microstructure. So we need some information about the, uh, uh, the amount of, uh, so when, when, excuse me, when we measure a certain hardness for a steel with a certain carbon content, how much martensite is the microstructure? We have this very convenient um, reference diagram for it. So here you have the carbon content, and here you have the hardness, yes? And so uh, we see that this is the line for 50% of martensite, yes? Okay, so this gives me the hardness, yes, for 50% martensite, 
at 0.4% of carbon. So this tells me that I will have 50% uh, of martensite at about half an inch. Yeah? That's, that's about a uh, little less than 1.5 centimeters away from the quenched end. Hmm? And you see that uh, for, for this highly alloyed steels, it's much, much deeper hmm? uh, below the surface. So, uh, right, so, so uh, if I use this AISI uh, 8640, not, not 50 steel gray, so I will have 50% of martensite at a distance slightly more than half an inch away from the water quenched end of my Chamonix bar. Okay, so what can I do with this information? Hmm? All right. Now, uh, in, in, in practice, um, this is a very simple test, uh, but it's a little bit inconvenient what you get as uh, information because uh, the parts you, you're interested in hardening look like this, for instance, um, a crankshaft for a motor, yes? And you want to know, well, you know, in, uh, you know, how much martensite will I have when I'm heat treating uh, this part and, and this part, yes? So you need information about typically cylindrical bars, yes? Okay, so, um, so, so I have, it, it say I'm using this particular steel here, yes? And 50% uh, uh, at the distance slightly more than this half an inch here uh, for the Germany bar. What does this correspond to for a cylinder? Okay, and there we have, again, reference diagrams, yes, that are provided, for instance, by the steel manu the people uh, that make these steels. Hmm? For instance, a company like uh, Timken makes uh, this kind of engineering steels for automotive applications. And so they will, you know, they will give you this data. Hmm? Right, so you have a look at uh, this half a, uh, a uh, slightly uh, uh, larger than half an inch distance. Yes, distance from the quench end. And here, this is related to the diameter of a bar. Yes? The problem is, you can see, there are many lines I can use. And what are these lines? Well, they're related to what we call the quench severity, yes? When we quench, you do a Jomini test, you basically use tap water, yes, to it's about around 20 degrees, you just quench this end, right? So you, it's a very um, high quenching rate, yes? Cooling rate. But for bars that you use in practice, yes, uh, you can use water, hmm? Uh, you can use circulating water, you can use still water, you can use oils. The oil can be circulating, the oil can be still. What is the, uh, the diameter? Hmm? Obviously, if I have a very uh, effective um, heat removal, yes, hmm, I, have, I will have a large diameter. So um, this uh, distance from the quenched end can corresponds to, for instance, three and a half inch bar will have a fully, it will have a 50% martensite at the center hmm, if I have what's called an ideal quench. Now, what's an ideal quench? Ideal quench is such that the temperature at the, at the surface is equal to the temperature of the coolant. Yes? If you keep the coolant flowing, yes, yes, you, you will have a situation like this. If, you, if your coolant is uh, stationary, obviously uh, the, uh, uh, you will have a less than ideal um, removal of heat and, the, and you'll have a much smaller uh, diameter that you can have 50% um, of martensite in the center, okay? So let's have a look here um, at say we say we um, we didn't we couldn't we're not, we can't afford this material because it's highly alloyed so we're looking at uh, unalloyed steels can we can we uh, 
uh, make this, uh, this material here. Hmm? So this is the, uh, uh, again, the 50% uh, the uh, uh, martensite. Yeah, so you have 50% martensite only very, very close to the surface. Yes. Okay, now I, I look here at what this corresponds to in this graph. Yes. You see that I have very, very tiny diameters. Yes. And that's for the ideal cooling. Yes. So you can imagine if I cool with oil, yes, I will, I will not be able to, uh, to achieve any uh, hardening of, for instance, a part like a crankshaft, okay? because the, the diameter uh, of the bar is too small. So this diameter that we find here with ideal cooling is called a DI, DI. And it's a very important parameter um, for engineering steels, di, the, the ideal diameter. Hmm? Uh, the ideal di diameter being the, the diameter where you will get 50% of martensite in the center of the bar if you do an ideal quench. Hmm? An ideal quench is surface of the metal is the same as the temperature of the coolant. Hmm? So, so we see here. Okay. So how, how how does this work? Yes. So we have um, uh, very important when you uh, get into uh, uh, if you would get ever get into the uh, discussions of um, hardenability of engineering steels for your research or for for your work is um, uh, some people define hardenability as. 90% or 100% of martensite in the center of the bar. Yes, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It is, there are different definitions. Yeah, um, but 50% martensite in the bar is very commonly used for engineering steels. Okay, so uh, all right. So um, let's let's just look here at this example here. Hmm? So this uh, di hmm, is the maximum diameter where you have 50% of marginal at center of the uh, bar in ideal conditions, yes? Okay, and how do we calculate this? Yes. So we, we can calculate this, um, and of course it will depend on a large number of factors. Yeah? It will depend on uh, the uh, uh, factors which are grouped into this first parameter here. The so-called critical diameter, hmm? critical diameter. Hmm? Okay, and this uh, is tabulated. This is a tabulated value, we, yes, based on carbon content, austenite grain size, and the severity of the cooling. Hmm? So every uh, type of cooling has a number assigned to it, called H. Yes, and H is. In the case of an ideal cooling, H is uh, infinite. And if you have a still oil cooling, H is 0.25, so much lower. Yeah. All right, so how does this work? Well, first, okay, um, you have, uh, we determine the, the critical um, diameter. Hmm? Okay, so how do, how do you, you, you you have to start with uh, conditions. You know, say we have a steel you know, with um, a certain composition. So you know the composition, uh, 0.3 carbon, 1% manganese, 0.4 silicon, 0.4 chrome, 0.3 molybdenum, and a, a grain size of, say, ASTM 6, hmm? which uh, corresponds to a grain size of 40 microns. Yeah? Right, so um, we use this first graph here. We select the, the grain size, uh, uh, six here, yeah, this line, yes. We select the carbon content, and this gives me a DC or DCI value, hmm, which is 40 millimeters, all right? And I need to multiply this with factors related to the composition, which we call hardenability factors, yeah? The larger the factor is for an element, the larger the impact on the hardenability. So 
not surprisingly, we see molybdenum, chrome, yes, as having a high multiplying factor. But so let, we look here in our uh, composition. We have 1% of manganese, so we go to alloy content. 1% of manganese, our factor is 2.2, yes? So this 14 millimeters, we multiply by 2, and we multiply uh, with the factor for silicon and chrome and manganese, etc. And so and we find at last a number, 67 millimeters, yes? This is the DI value of your, your steel, yes? So that's the, the, the diameter you would get in ideal conditions, yes, of, um, of cooling. So this bar that uh, gives me a DI of 67, yes? <coughs> has 50% manganese yes, uh, at the center of the, the bar after an ideal cooling, yeah. the ideal quench. Hmm? But in actuality, you never use water to uh, heat treat, except you're, if you're a student and you want really fast cooling rates, you use water. But in, in general, you, we don't quench uh, engineering steels rapidly because otherwise we may get surface cracks. Yes? Um, and uh, we may get distortions. Yeah, so we actually do relatively, um, uh, we, we use a lot of oil to, to, to do quenching. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so we have non-ideal quenches. Mm -hmm. yes. And the factor uh, for oil is, is typically 0 0.3, 0 0.5 uh, rather than. And so the, the actual ideal diameter is about 30 millimeters. So, so if you want to understand this, let's, let's mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so instead of having an ideal diameter here, which would be uh, uh, 67, yes, when we have oil cooling, yes, it gets reduced to close to three centimeters, yes? Okay? So that means that um, engineering steels, when they are produced, mm, the composition uh, that is required from the manufacturer may Im include requirements related to DI value, yes, which is composition dependent. Yeah? Because, and uh, does the, for what kind of products does this happen? It doesn't happen for sheet products because the, you know, if you want to heat treat sheet products, that's very easy. Yes, they're f they're only uh, millimeters thick, right? But uh, for bar products, hmm, things you make uh, crankshafts with, for instance, um, that's important to have a composition that gives you the right DI value. Hmm? So you're sure that the material uh, you made has the, uh, the correct amount of martensite in the microstructure after uh, heating, uh, heat treatments. But this method is called the Grossman method, yes. Uh, the original Grossman method uh, uses the, 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 the plots that I showed you. Nowadays, uh, we have um, facilities where we can uh, do very rapid thermal treatments in terms of heating and cooling. Um, and uh, we use, for instance, uh, leaner alloys to get same uh, properties. So there are other parameters involved, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the Grossman method uh, has evolved. And there, uh, for instance, now you can get um, uh, data that allows you to look at hardenability of steels with much lower carbon contents, less than 0.2. Yes, for instance, this is here a multiplying factor graph for, uh, for carbon, where you go below 0.2 percent. Yes. And um, as people uh, are learning more, or have learned more about uh, hardenability, also the, the relative hardenability scale for different elements has also changed. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, here you can see, uh, this is more modern data than the original data. Um, so let me go back here. If you look at the original approach, 
Yes? Right. You see that the multiplying factor for molybdenum is very high. Yes? It, it's, you know, it's a perfect hardenability element. Yes? If we look at uh, more recent data, yes, or more recent uh, uh, evaluation of the effect of uh, molybdenum, you see that uh, actually uh, manganese has a, uh, a hardenability is almost equivalent to that of uh, molybdenum. Mm -hmm. And um, people like me are very uh, aware of this, this phenomenon, yes, which has, uh, which has uh, not been used enough in steel uh, design, yes, the uh, incredible um, hardenability potency of manganese, yes. So that's led to lots of developments where people have used uh, expensive alloying additions, uh, molybdenum alloying additions, whereas um, you know, they could have done very well with um, um, uh, manganese instead. Right, okay, let's... Uh, another thing that's important is that uh, there are interactions, yes? It's certain parameters are very sensitive to the presence of other elements. And uh, one of them is the, uh, the, f the imp impact for carbon, for instance, on the boron. Hmm? You, you know that boron is extremely efficient hardenability element, yes? It will uh, allow you to, to make uh, martensite by uh, basically uh, suppressing ferrite nucleation, yes? However, if you have high amounts of carbon, yes, high amounts of carbon, you see that this m the multiplying factor for boron decreases, hmm? yes? And that if you are close to the perlytic reaction, yes, the boron effect is, is non-existent, yes? Why is that? Well, when you add carbon, carbon has a tendency to also go to grain boundaries, yes? And there is a competition between boron and carbon, certainly at high carbon levels, whereby the, the carbon basically uh, uh, replaces boron on the austenite grain boundaries. And as a consequence, you have a lowering or no hardenability when you add um, when, when you look at higher uh, carbon containing steels. So don't add boron in very high carbon steels. Um, it's, it's not going to have any hardening uh, impact. That's the message. All right, so let's now um, uh, ask ourselves uh, with what we know, um, can we already design steels? Uh, with the, with the level of sophistication we have reached in our knowledge, uh, is there anything useful uh, we can uh, make, for instance? Well, uh, you'd be surprised uh, that that's indeed the case. So remember, we looked at um, uh, our uh, steel here, focused on uh, eutectoid composition because that's gives me a simple uh, diagram, yes, with uh, so-called C-curves here for perlite at higher temperature, for bainite at lower temperature. You remember that we form spherodite if we anneal at very long times, yes. And then we have our martensite athermal transformation lines here uh, below. Hmm? Okay, so let's say, hmm, this, I don't know why this is called cycle, okay, cycle one, excuse me. Um, that was a little bit too fast here. Yeah. So cycle one, what happens if I do uh, a thermal, simple thermal cycle? We cool to from austenite, homogeneous austenite to 350, and then hold it for 100,000 seconds before cooling to room temperature. So if we, I do this, we'll do this temperature, 
or 50, hold it there for uh, 10,000 seconds, excuse me, yes. And uh, so what do we get? We get 100% bainite, yes? Okay, because once it's transformed to bainite, it doesn't matter uh, whether you cool uh, uh, through the MS-MF temperature range, it's already transformed, so nothing happens, right? Okay, let's do another one. We cool to 250 this time, we keep it 100 seconds, and then we cool to room temperature. So this would look like this, austenitized. Cool it very quickly, yeah, so very fast cool indeed. Keep it there for uh, 100 seconds and then quench it. Uh, during this hold here, nothing happens, yes? Yes, uh, there is no bainite transfer, there's no martensite transformation. You really have to go through the MSMF temperature range to form 100% of martensite. And there may be some retained austenite in the microstructure. Right, so let's do a bit something a bit more complicated. We Another cycle, we cool to 360, we hold 10 seconds, and we cool to 400 C, and then uh, hold it there for 1,000 seconds, and then cool to room temperature. So what do we get? So we go from here to here. We transform uh, to about 50% of um, perlite, yes, in our microstructure, and then we cool down from here to here, yes. Now we have... 0% of bainite, yes, and the transformation uh, after 1,000 seconds is uh, you, you, you did what hadn't transformed after the perlitic transfer is now transformed to bainite. Yeah? So when I, I quench, nothing happens again. Uh, when I go uh, through the MSMF temperature range and I end up with 50% uh, perlite, 50% bainite. Yeah? So I can make more complex microstructures, hmm? always the same alloy. So do you say, well, you probably think, okay, this, this, these are like baby things, yes? Uh, that's, we, no, that's not being used industrially, this kind of um, you know, stepped isothermal, um, s simple isothermal uh, tests. Um, they're just um, for academic persons. That's not actually the case. Uh, um, there's a lot of uh, strip material, yeah, that is, is being processed uh, this way hmm, uh, in isothermal steps hmm, uh, to, to make um, objects. Hmm. Uh, see, we'll give a few examples in, in a moment, right? So, so uh, these lines, this is an, uh, uh, an example of a line like this. Hmm. There's a, a different segments here, and we'll talk about them in more detail. So what, what comes in are these uh, coils, yes, these narrow coils of strip material. So if you uncoil them, you get long, long strips of steel, yes, they, and they go into this uh, line uh, like this. Hmm? So let's have a look at what this uh, furnace basically looks like. So, um, and it's used, uh, commonly used to do uh, heat treatment of narrow strip. Hmm? And one of the things you can do with line like this is you can do austemper a steel. So what is austempering? <coughs> it's very simple. We already discussed this. You go, you austenitize the material, and then you do an isothermal quench to the bainite transformation range, and you turn the uh, material into a relatively strong and tough uh, bainitic a microstructure. So, so how does it work? You uncoil the, the strip here, you go through an austenitizing furnace. Hmm? Um, the quenching here is done by a liquid metal, it can be for instance lead, hmm? liquid lead, uh, uh, liquid lead. Hmm? Uh, leveling uh, furnace is a, so that the temperature is homogenized. Hmm? Okay. And then you do a tempering furnace. That's where you, kep, you keep uh, this, the strip at uh, the bainite transformation temperature before cooling it with this jet cooling part. And then you, you roll the strip back up. Yes. Uh, so what's happened be be between the, f the start and the end? Here you have a very simple soft steel. Here you have a very hard, uh, tough steel. Hmm? You can rearrange this furnace, yes? Uh, to make other types of uh, microstructures. For instance, 
you can make uh, again narrow strip that is mar tempered. So the word mar tempering uh, you know, has a first part martensite and the second part tempering. So you basically make tempered martensite microstructure. So again, you you uh, uncoil your strip here. It goes into, of course, austenitizing furnace. Yeah. You cool the uh, strip rapidly. So you go from austenite to martensite. Mm -hmm. And um, then you go uh, increase the temperature in this leveling furnace. Yes. Keep it isothermally till your tempering time is finished, and then you quench it again uh, and uh, roll up the strip. Mm -hmm. This allows you to uh, turn this relatively soft starting material in an extremely hard uh, uh, strip after this process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, what would you do it? Uh, what would you do? For instance, when, when you produce saws, you ever wonder where saws come from? You know, to, to, uh, that's how you make them. You make this heat-treated narrow strip, yeah, and uh, with the composition and the um, the right composition and the right um, um, heat treatment, you can you can achieve very high uh, and very hard uh, materials to cut. This is another example here of quench and tempering because maybe the quench and tempering you want to uh, do is not on a, um, on, a on a narrow strip but perhaps on a bar yes and and here you see how um, the, so the 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 yellow thing here that goes here hmm, is a uh, heated bar hmm, steel bar and the, the units you see here, the red units here, are inductors. Inductors. So they, you, you heat the bar by induction. This goes very rapidly and it's a non-contact heating. Yes? And then, um, so you, you induction heat uh, the bar. You see the bar here. And the bar here enters this box here. Hmm? And that's where you have a quenching. Yes? The, the way the quenching is carried out is you see here these circular loops of water jets, yes, that cool the uh, the surface of the bar, yes, um, so you quench it, and then you go through again in induction heating, yes, so you reheat the bar so it tempers and it, it regains, it loses some of its uh, hardness but it regains. Uh, some toughness. Hmm? You can see the bar uh, being, yeah? Okay, so, and so here, here you're looking inside the, the quenching unit here. Hmm? So these are uh, 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 methods that are used very, um, uh, very, very commonly. Hmm? This uh, uh, martensitic transformation and then the tempering. Um, but obviously, uh, there are uh, uh, challenges when you do complex heat treatments, because uh, you see, when you um, when you heat something up, yes, uh, that will cost money, yes, because you need to have a furnace. Uh, uh, either you uh, have to pay for electricity or for natural gas, yes. Um, and when you cool down, certainly when you cool down very quickly, you, uh, you will need uh, large amounts of coolant, yes? Um, and, you know, it adds to the production costs, yeah? So uh, materials development is also, uh, certainly when it's uh, uh, related to steels, uh, there's an effort in simplifying thermal treatments, yes? And so um, as much as we love these complex uh, heat treatments, yes, uh, we have to look at what are the final properties. Hmm? Okay? And I'll, I'll give you an example where you can actually um, do away with very complex heat treatments and replace them by very simple ones. Yes? And 
An example where this happened is uh, in, uh, in, hot, in forgings. So originally, or uh, there are people who still use this, you, you hot forge the material, okay? Then you, uh, you austenitize it. You, if you want to have a martensitic microstructure, you austenitize it. Yes, you temper it to regain your, uh, uh, you know, so, some um, uh, toughness. And then you straighten the, the part because when you do the quenching, there's usually thermal distortions. Usually distortions. Once you've straightened the material, the way you straighten this is by applying stresses, hmm, deforming the uh, material. And then you need to, in many applications, to stress relief. Do low temperature stress relief uh, uh, treatment. Okay? So it's complicated and it's costly. Now you can get similar properties Yes. So, so in the, the first uh, microstructure you get is basically tempered martensite. Hmm? The second approach is very much simpler. You hot forge the material, and right after the hot forging, you just let it cool down slowly. Do slow air cooling. And the structure you get at the end here yes, is basically not martensite, yes, but it's just ferrite plus perlite, yes? And what gives you this um, the, the very high strength, yes, is small additions of vanadium. The vanadium forms vanadium carbonitrides, yes, precipitations in the microstructure, yes, and you get a very strong, very pronounced precipitation hardening effect. Yes? The properties are equivalent to the, uh, the ones you get after the, the top heat treatment. Yes? And, uh, and you can imagine that the, costs, the cost of the additional small additions of vanadium are um, uh, compensated by the, um, the, the, simplif the simplification of the, uh, the thermal treatment. Yeah? Okay, because this is an example here. So what, um, uh, what can you use this for? Well, for instance, for this um, crankshafts here. You, know, you, can, you can basically use uh, this approach to make crankshafts. You know, and we produce millions and millions of those. Yeah? Uh, so it's very important that uh, to have a s simple and reliable heat treatment. So this is an example here. Uh, you have uh, carbon contents 0.4, typical engineering steels, mm -hmm. uh, one to one and a half centimanganese, so silicon, low sulfur, and here this is the important part, yes, is the, the vanadium additions. And you can see that uh, vanadium additions are typically mm, in the range of 0.1 to high, val high values 0.2, yes. So very low amounts. Yeah. Okay, so the strengthening uh, is due to the vanadium carbonitrides precipitates. The sulfur here, I just want to uh, mention this, uh, uh, is higher than normal. Usually, you in, in many applications you like to have no sulfur. Yes, as low as possible. Mm -hmm. A uh, few ppm, if at all possible. In, for engineering steels, in many cases, that rule doesn't hold because you want to be able to machine these parts. Yes? And in, in order to make them uh, easily machinable, you add sulfur. Hmm? And you get then uh, manganese sulfides, which, are, uh, which uh, make chip production. Hmm? Chip uh, during the uh, machining uh, easier. So that's why we add sulfur in this case. So uh, don't think, so we, we, I, I gave you an example of a, um, a strip that is being uh, heat treated. Yeah? Give you an example of bars that are being heat treated, uh, 
and a uh, crank, crankshaft. But um, there are some huge parts, steel uh, parts that are uh, being heat treated. Uh, uh, take for instance here, um, very large forgings um, are, uh, are commonly heat treated. And so this is, for instance, we use ingots, these cylindrical ingots here. Then uh, these things go into open die forges and here on the um, uh, right here you have this, this uh, gigantic uh, computer controlled arm that takes this very hot metal into this uh, forging uh, die uh, equipment here you can see it again here it's another part of the forging and you can see slowly this, this piece getting uh, some shape here. Okay. Uh, and then you do heat treatments to the surface. You machine it and then you basically take this uh, austenitized, huge austenitized cylinder and you put it in a quenching bath to give it uh, the heat treatment that you want. And here you see uh, the end result. It's uh, it's a uh, roll that will be used to, in a rolling mill, yes? Okay. Um, other example here. This is then, actually, no, sorry, this is not a, um, this is a, a forging that is actually used to make a turbine uh, axis, axle. Mm -hmm. So here, the, the, this part here is then machined Lots of it, lots, lots of material is removed, and you, you're left with these these parts here where the turbine blades will be fitted on. Eventually, looks like this: the turbine blades are fitted on. You put it in the uh, the, the, the turbine's body, and this is this is where this large forging ends up. Okay. All right. Good. So the, the, the general aspects of uh, heat treatments are, uh, are well known, yes? Now, we have some simple things. Let's, let's look at a situation that is of, um, of interest to us when we think about uh, steel products. And, um, and, and let's have a look at a um, a very um, uh, important uh, part of any piece of machinery, and those are bearings. Be bearings are extremely important. We uh, uh, manufacture uh, huge amounts of this, yes. And uh, this is basically, well, there are different types of bearings, yes, but let's, let's just, uh, simple example, you have a ball bearing here, yes. Um, they're made of steel, yes. They're made of uh, high carbon steels. And uh, the way the, the, originally, the original steel looks like is wire rod. Yes? Now, not all wire rod you see on the roads in Pohang are used to make um, ball bearings, but you know, um, important uh, part of it is. is. Hmm? So in uh, these steels, Mm -hmm. um, these ball bearings, we typically have, these are very high carbon content steels, yes? Yeah. The uh, wire products are uh, steel products that have some of the highest carbon contents uh, that you can think of. Yeah? Uh, we, uh, we use them to make uh, cables and we also use them to make um, uh, uh, nuts and bolts, we use them to make ball bearings, yes, and many other things. We'll discuss that in more detail. What's of interest to us now is how can we um, see the impact of the heat treatment, yes, on the microstructure of this kind of steel. All right, so, um, so when you, uh, you want to predict the um, uh, microstructure that you that you get, yes, you basically need 
three basic diagrams. Yeah? First of all, you need to have a, a thermal treatment diagram, yeah, which tells you, okay, I'm going to do this yeah, as a function of time. I'm going to heat up, keep it 10 minutes at 1,000 degrees, and then cool it down. I can quench it, or I can do isothermal um, transformations. Uh, then uh, you need to know what the system, the alloy system, what the alloy system's equilibrium situation is. So you basically have to have a nice iron carbon diagram, yes? Again, we're not interested in the entire iron carbon, we're just interested in the iron rich part of it, yes? That's why you only see this low temperature iron rich segment, yes? And we've indicated on this diagram also the MSMF temperature. Yes, again, I, uh, MSMF temperatures are not equilibrium temperatures, but it's interesting to have them there. Yes, uh, because the uh, yeah, because the MS and MF temperature are carbon uh, dependent. Yes, and. Um, for all the steels below 1%, 1.5%, you see if you cool down quick enough, yes, you can turn all these steels into martensite. Yeah? Okay, so it's interesting to have this information on your phase diagram. And then the third diagram we have um, is, the, is basically a transformation diagram. Yes? And there we like to use CCT diagrams. If you don't have CCT diagrams, you can use TTT diagrams. So, okay. All right. So this is a CCT diagram. So, um, and uh, so we'll, let's have a look at um, a first um, situation here. Hmm? Uh, we have one percent of uh, carbon. Yes, and we're going to do. Let me get a pen here. Yes, we're going to do this heat treatment. We're going to uh, so so cool down. Yes, cool down. Yes, and then go through the perlite transformation like this. All right. And um, so, what um, am I going to to see when I uh, I cool down? And I go through, um, I can't really see here, I need to, around a little bit below 700. Yes, yes. I'm, go I'm doing the transformation. What do I see? Okay. Oh, okay. So, so, so excuse me. This, this is just a general thing, and, and this is then um, the, um, in, in more detail. Okay. So, so we do a first cycle. Uh, we austenitize and we quench, yes, quickly. So that means we go from this temperature very quickly, we quench. So what do I see? Uh, if, if I can do it fast enough, yes, uh, I should get martensite, all right? So quench fast enough. Quenching fast enough, 50 degrees per second. Uh, it's a little bit, it's like... Um, you, you would need to have uh, sprays to get that cooling rate. But it's, it's, uh, it's not very difficult to get this. So this is what you get. Hmm? This is what you get. And uh, so, so it, it looks like something you've seen before. You can see these uh, uh, martensite uh, units here. Yes. So we get martensite. Okay, but if I look more carefully, yes, here... Uh, you can see this. You have these, these wiggly things here in the microstructure. And that is not um, martensite, but that's cementite. So where does this cementite come from? Let's go back. Well, very simple. When I go from here to here, yes, what does the phase diagram tell me? Well, you can form cementite. So apparently, even though I cool down very quickly, Hmm? I did make some cementite in my microstructure. That's one thing that was not obvious from this. And the other thing here 
is that when I cool down here, when I cool down, excuse me, yes, the time at high temperature was enough to have tempering. And we call this auto-tempering. And how do I know that the martensite is tempered? Because when we look at high magnification, you see the martensite has all these little dots in it. You know? And uh, that's basically cementite. Or perhaps low temperature transition carbides that are precipitated in the microstructure. And these, um, th these tell me that uh, the carbon is not fully in solution yes, and has precipitated out of solution. Why would something like this happen if you quench so rapidly? Well, when you quench, there is a phase transformation. The austenite changes to ferrite. So we already know that there are dimensional changes, yes, expansions. But there's another thing that happens. The heat of transformation is released. There is, so there is a, uh, the material uh, during the transformation, there is a heat of transformation that's released. So it, the material gets warmer. And so, and that causes the material to auto temper. Yes? Heat is enough to get uh, uh, the um, material to temper the martensite. So that's something that very often happens, yeah? this auto tempering. Let's look at the second cycle here. Yeah? Uh, now we uh, 1050 here, mm -hmm. and then we go to 770. Keep it, keep it there, and then we will we'll cool. So, so now we go from here to here. So look, we're above this temperature here. Right? This temperature, by the way, remember this is the AE1 temperature, right? right? So we're above this. So what should I get when I keep this temperature here? Well, first of all, is there a transformation? Well, I, this is a, no, there's no transformation. I'm not gonna make perlite, basically. So what should I get? Well, um, well I should form cementite, yes? and austenite in this range. And then when I cool, well, perhaps if, if I cool very rapidly, as is shown here, whatever is not transformed to cementite will form perlite. No? Oh, excuse me, martensite. No? Excuse, me, excuse me about this. Okay, so let's see other direction, what we get. Okay, let's go on. So now we, stuff looks pretty much the same thing. I've, I get, um, uh, uh, so something that looks uh, like martensite. Yeah? It's also tempered. I see all these little carbides in the martensite. And the, the cementite, this grain boundary cementite, yes, is here. Hmm? You don't get much grain boundary cementite, of course. Why don't you get much grain boundary cementite? Because the fraction, remember, of cementite, Fe3C fraction, is equal to what? Is equal to the length of this segment, yes, divided by the length of this segment, right? Okay, so it's a very small volume fraction that you make, okay? Okay. And the fast cooling that I did afterwards um, turned everything into the, 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 the untransformed austenite uh, at high temperature into um, martensite, of course. All right. Okay, so let's do something different now. We, uh, we go and sit right at 730, yes, which is this very close to AE3. Yes? Okay. So here we have to look at the surface, which may be slightly cooler than the interior of the material. Yes? Let's see what we, what we get. Yeah. At the uh, center of the material, yes, I see basically my pro-eutectoid cementite, that's cementite, 
and then martensite. At the surface, the temperature is slightly cooler. Yes? So there, we form mar uh, uh, excuse me, perlite. You can see some perlite nodules here. Yes? Okay, but not in the interior. And the reason is because of this small temperature difference. Yeah? So, so even though it's really unexpected, excuse me, yeah, there is very big difference. You can get very big difference in the microstructure within very narrow temperature ranges. Okay, and now let's do what um, typically do in industrial situation. You will go from uh, 1050 to 650, yes? And then keep the temperature constant. So here we, we should see uh, prolytic microstructure, basically. Yeah? Let's see what we get. And that is true right now. Um, so the microstructure looks very different. And you actually have to look into the, uh, the SEM to see uh, these alternating layers of cementite and ferrite um, in your microstructure. That's, and that's totally fully perlytic. Hmm. All right, so uh, so we already discussed this part of the uh, compositions of steels last week. Okay, so, so what we, we've seen is that um, even, even with, you know, when you know the basic principles of, um, of transformation and heat treatment, we can already generate very many different microstructures with different properties, and, and, and they have different properties. Uh, one of the things, um, and I, I want to continue a little bit uh, uh, about this, is that there are things that we, we can do uh, in um, development of steel products is we don't only have to heat and cool, you know. We can heat and strain the material, deform it to get properties. That's, you know, and that happens a lot actually in particular in when you, we make sheet products. We, we do thermal treatments and mechanical treatments at the same time, yes? Okay, so first, um, I need to say, uh, before I, I go into uh, detail uh, on this, I need to say a few things about grain, the effect of grain size on transformations. Yeah? And in particular, the effect of uh, the austenite grain size on diffusional transformation. So one of the things um, I, uh, people sometimes forget is that when you take a phase, um, not a phase diagram, a, a transformation diagram, whether it's a CCT diagram or a TTT diagram, they think it's, it applies universally. Actually, it doesn't. It only applies for the particular grain size for which that diagram was made. Hmm? So if you change the grain size of the austenite, yes, you will have a very different transformation behavior. Hmm? Why, why would that be? Because it's the same transformation, right? It's the same nucleation and growth. Yeah? Well, let's just look at very big austenite grains. And let's look at very tiny austenite grains, yeah? And you assume that nucleation rates and uh, growth rates are the same, yeah? 
So right, so you've got when you form ferrite, it forms, it nucleates on grain boundaries. Yes. So we'll say, yes, in uh, this, this is a unit, a, u a volume unit, the same volume unit here and there, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we make two precipitates every unit of time, yes? So at time uh, t1, we, we make, yes, two units, two nuclei, yes, in each case, yes? And uh, at time... Uh, T2, yes, mm -hmm. I make uh, two more units. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, etc. Now what's important here is this. Yes, when I have large grains, these guys don't look like these. Here there are no nucleation. There's, there's no, nothing is happening here. If the grain size here is small, yes, and I do at the same distance, I have the same unit, yes, I will also have a grain in this unit, yes? Yes, and this one will also transform, yes? Same way, two units, yeah, not more. I didn't, you know, there's no magic. It's just, this one doesn't do anything, yes? Whereas here, here, so in other words, the nucleation rate, yes, be, being the same, I still get faster kinetics, yes, because of the grain size. Yeah? Um, right, so, so if you have a C curve for a particular uh, steel and a particular grain size, yes, when you reduce the grain size, yes, you will enhance, yeah, so this is one grain size, and this is a smaller grain size, yes? And there is um, more or less, uh, a, you know, rule, you know, if, you, if, if you have one grain size, yes, you can calculate uh, where this uh, will be, um, for a smaller grain size, uh, for instance, like this, if, if you have a uh, first austenite grain size that's smaller than the s a second austenite grain size, then the ratios, yes, the ratios of the times needed for a certain amount of transformation, yes, are, are such that, uh, so the ratios of these two times are the same as the ratios of the grain uh, diameters. So, so, so T1 divided by T2 is equal to D1 over D2, yes? Okay, so that allows you to, and, and of course, if uh, D1 is smaller than D2, yes, it means that T1 will always be smaller than T2. Right? So, this, this, so this, basically, your uh, transformation curves move to the left, yeah? Very important in what we will see next Monday. Thank you for your attention. Professor